right, so we're going to talk a little bit about homelessness. Um, so here's some fact checks for you. Chronic homeless is the term given to individuals that experience long-term or repeated bouts of homelessness. However, they only make up 15% of the entire ho- homeless population, only 15 Nearly 48,000, or 8.5 of all homeless people, are actual U.S. veterans. 20% of the homeless have serious mental issues or conditions related to chronic, chronic substance abuse. Studies show that a renter earning the federal minimum wage of seven twenty five per hour would need to work 90 hours per week to afford a one-bedroom rental home at the fair market rent and 112 hours per week to afford a two-bedroom home. A lack of employment opportunities combined with the decline in public assistance leaves a low-income families just in illness or accident away from being put on the streets themselves. According to the National Alliance to End Homeless, over 610,042 people experience homelessness on any given night in the United States of America. One in eight Americans live on incomes that put them at risk for hunger. More than 13 million Americans rely on food banks for assistance. A report from the U.S. Conference of Mayors found that only 11% of those requesting emergency food assistance were homeless. That's only 11% people. More than 21 million low-income children qualify for free or reduced-cost school lunches at this point. Although most people associate food banks with the holidays, however, studies have shown they get more people during summer months for food assistance. There are 1.3 million homeless students in America's schools right now at this minute. Now, as you might have been able to tell, myself, I've been homeless off and on in my lifetime. So this is kind of a uh, more of a different aspect um, than what I would normally do with my podcast. So let me start off. Like I just said, I have been homeless off and on in my life. To myself, there are three types of homeless people around. You have chronic homeless. This type often enjoys it. Often they will say things like, I have no bills. I have no boss. I can sleep wherever I want to. Frankly, some just seem to enjoy it. However, don't get it misconstrued. Not all people do. Some people really are down on their luck and trying to get off the streets. You also have a mix of youth among the homeless. You have runaway youth. However, you also have children that are born homeless, meaning that their parents are homeless, and this happens way more than you might think in this country. You often hear people say, well, there are shelters they can get help at. Personal experience, however, I challenge you to go and find out for yourselves. A lot of times the waiting list can be weeks long to get a bed. If around the holidays, you're in for a much longer of a wait time. Also, another thing is most rescue missions will take the elderly and youth before other people, including women. So they're going to take the elderly and the youth and women before us other regular guys. I want to put that out there. I've experienced this. I know one of the rescue missions I stayed at was closed down after the pastor was arrested for financial crimes. They, this particular rescue mission would often use ice cream mix as a form of milk. And they would say things like, well, it still has vitamin A and D in it. They would also use expired food. The local Albertsons, they used to throw away donuts. So the rescue mission would grab these donuts up in these garbage bags, and they used to put them on large baking sheets by the smoking area all day. I remember personally, I used to have to scrape ants off of them along with other insects. It is the reason why I could barely eat donuts to this day. I mean, if you really had to sit there and scrape insects and ants off of your food daily, would you be too keen on the idea of eating them after you went through that off and on? Um, You know, I want to say I was was homeless off and on for a matter of years, so I do know a lot about this area. So when you stayed at the rescue mission, you were required to attend church, AA and NA meetings. The fact that it is hard to get a bed a lot of the time This leads to communities among the homeless. What I mean is, like in Marysville, California, where I was homeless at off and on for a good portion of time, one we used to call the jungle. It was down by the river and the tree areas. Another one we called city tunnels. These were in the ground, 
also through the sewer, mainly through the sewers of certain areas that was easy to access. Certain people knew the routes to get down there. Interesting enough, when you go down there, you'll find like, you know, white spray paint with arrows showing you where to go to where they actually have put beds down there. I still don't know to this day how they fit them into those manway covers, but they did. Also, another place you could go to was under bridges. If large enough, under the under the underpasses, you could find close to about five beds underneath them. Some people would sleep in the park, hoping to get gel if it was cold outside. Also, abandoned houses. Although, this should be used as a last resort for a lot of reasons, such as safety reasons and police patrolling different neighborhoods, seeing lights flickering or, you know, from candles or lighters, whatever. Often, sinks, toilets do not have running water. And often, they would be filled with urine and feces, and often the carpets would be soaked with the urine from people, you know, well, urinating on the carpets. Normally, you would use candles for light so you can blow them out in a hurry if uh, police showed up, you know, like patrolling around. Also, dangerous due to the fact that you would find broken pipes and used needles everywhere. Believe me, it is a lot tougher life than you might realize. Especially when you're trying to get off the streets. I remember only having a rayon shirt that had a sweat stain on the back and an oversized pair of slacks that were colored green and some old dress socks. And, you know, some tennis shoes that were kind of worn down to the point to where they looked like, you know, they would talk to you, basically, as the saying goes. Um, that's what they had available at the rescue mission when I went, you know. Um, but anyways, I went to McDonald's and asked for a cup of water. I filled out an application. I handed it to the manager on duty. As I got up to leave, however, I heard laughing. So, you know, I looked back at them and they were ripping up the application. At this point... Understand, I was actually trying to get off the streets. You know, I was like, fuck it, I'll, I'll try it at McDonald's. Anybody get a job at McDonald's. I got so mad at the situation. I went across the street to a Mervyn's. I stole a pair of boxer slacks, dress shirt, and even a pair of sunglasses. I went back to the same McDonald's. I filled out the application. I handed it to the manager on duty. Before I made it to the door, he hollered at me to stay for an interview. After a couple of weeks of, my, of me proving myself to the management team, that's when I finally told him I was the same person whose application they were ripping up. He was apologetic, however. I say this to give an example of how some people are trying to get off the streets. And they do try to get jobs, but this is the reaction that employers often have with them. You know, so this is an example of people won't hire the homeless a lot of times because it's hard to stay clean, you know, whatever. Another problem that comes up is if you're staying at a shelter, you are going by the shelter's time just to sleep on a bed. The problem is jobs will not be understanding of that whatsoever. They say they are, but they're not. Trust me, I've been there. They're not. At one point when I get off, I had nowhere to go. So I would get four cardboard boxes and I would find a bush and make a makeshift shelter for the night, often against like a side of bushes that was in a parking lot. You know, and then I would get up in the morning time and then I would go to the Taco Bell when they open because it was the only place in the town where you could lock the door from the inside bathroom. And at that point, I would use paper towels and hand soap to wash my body, although I was eventually let go for hygiene issues and the way the uniform looked. Again, I didn't, you know, really have that much money when I first started, uh, you know what I mean? So... Luckily, I met a girl who lived in the house with her family during this time. That was where I started working two jobs at the same time. A graveyard shift at Denny's as a dishwasher and a lunch line cook at a Dairy Queen. My point is, most people, if given a chance, really are trying to get ahead. Now, a lot of times, homeless people will become like family towards each other after traveling and camping together for a long time. It is weird to think about. However, they do develop their own sense of community. Part of this problem is they are very aggressive towards outsiders. They really are. I mean, they a lot of them have mental issues, like I said before. And, and I mean, it could get dangerous. Also earlier, I do feel that most people really are trying to get ahead in life and off the streets. However, I will say this isn't entirely always the case. This is why earlier I stated about the different types that are out there. I also wanted to include some personal aspects for myself in this podcast. 
I was homeless off and on for years. However, I also tried to find work in every way absolutely that I could. Meaning I would even shovel up dog shit if I had to. It didn't matter what it was. Another personal story I have is one time at the St. Denny's that I would later work at on the graveyard shift. Before I worked there, I asked someone for change. They spit on me and told me to go get a fucking job. I really was only about $2 short of getting something to eat. And if I, my memory serves me complex, I want to say it was an appetizer thing. This is why if someone um, asked myself for change, I ask them for what for. I tell them to be honest. I know I know what you're saying. Naive thinking. They could tell you anything. And you're absolutely right. They could. However, the answers they give when you treat them like a regular human being sometimes honestly will outstand you. They'll be straight up honest and say, look, man, I'm trying to get a pack of smokes, a beer, or something to eat. Depending on their honesty will depend on if I decide to help them or not. I treat them the same as I do anyone else. We live in one of the greatest countries in the world, yet we have a poverty problem. A lot of the problem is wages and living conditions. I watched a documentary recently that touched up on this fact. One girl was working two jobs. Her monthly income was around $950. She said that the list is so long on, a waiting, on the waiting aspect for assistance, she, was staying, she had to resort to staying at a day's end with her two kids and her mother-in-law. And she would, the whole time she was trying to convince her kids that this is somewhat normal because her kids are still going to school at the same time. She was spending around... She was spending around $800 to stay there. Like she said, I do not have enough money for a down payment of an apartment because I pay to stay here. If not that, then me and my kids will be on the streets. The thing to take from this is she stated the waiting list for assistance is so long. Keep this in mind. She is on the list, meaning she is on the list for assistance. I think differently. We need more assistance programs, state assistance. Also, the programs needed to be reevaluated. I think there are far way too many illegal immigrants on state assistance creating a drain problem. I think people would be shocked at how many there are with false documentation. Seriously, amazing. Another issue is a lot of people lie, cheat, and steal from the system, as well as they know people that work in different county agencies. There are even cases of people using... Uh, people who have passed away and they use their social security numbers. So do I think aggressively deporting illegals is a way to go to fix some of it? First off, I use the word some. I want to emphasize the word some. And yes, it will provide way more assistance help for people, which means the homeless population trying to get extra help would actually have a better chance of getting approved for assistance. Sorry to tell you people. However, it is very true that illegals are draining our system, our national system for assistance as well as employers do not want to hire American citizens when they can hire illegals for far cheaper. There was a time when homeless people could find day work with the hope of getting hired full-time after proving themselves. However, no more. Instead, they hire illegals. What's more, a lot of businesses also have a lot of illegal immigrants that they hire with fake paperwork, meaning false social security numbers, false birth certificate, or doctored. If they, were, if they were already legal, unfortunately, they will hire family members who are illegal before they hire other people. Since they are managers, no one really bats an eye at this situation. Something with construction and industrial workers will hire illegal family and friends. Now, why do I bring this up? Here is why. All these examples are types of jobs people down on their luck historically have been able to get a job at. Fast food. Restaurant jobs, construction, agriculture, janitorial, etc., etc. You know people. You've heard them saying it. Uh, when you hear the argument for illegal immigration, you hear a lot of people saying, well, why deport illegals? We're just doing jobs that the American people do not want to do. How wrong can they possibly be? Plenty of homeless and people living in hotels would love a chance to do these type of jobs. The huge problem is within the level of the state and employment practices. See, other countries recently in Europe woke up and said, no more immigrants. We cannot afford them. We need to focus on our own people. Not here. Some politicians say, open the borders. We are broke, but come right on in. We will just raise taxes and things will get hired to buy. Guess what else happens 
Money aid and programs for assistance are going away as a result, causing a huge spike in homeless camps and popping up everywhere. This is why recently you've seen more and more reports on homeless camps. You never really saw those before. They've always been there, but now they're getting out of hand. Well, this is the reason why. Also, state programs are getting slashed and thrown out as well as workers getting laid off. However, I will admit, overall, our country is financially showing signs of getting better. We have major employment growth as well as industrial growth. Let's all pray it continues to grow. I also want to say there are major problems within the homeless populations. There are high numbers of drug use, prostitution, and homicides as well as just deaths from general health and environmental conditions. There is a lot to understand as well. I will still say deporting illegals providing real help for our veterans and more youth uh, programs can put a major dent in the homeless population numbers that are getting way out of hand. Not over a matter of months or even a year, however, over a period of a couple of years, I'm sure it would start to, you know, fix some of that problem. If we start to fix some major issues within the system, maybe we could start to help other problems such as homelessness getting out of hand. So, like I said before, there was a lot of aspects of uh, personal stories and testimonies for myself over the period of time that I was homeless. And the reason for that is because I don't think unless you walk a mile in their shoes, you could truly understand what it's like to go through what they're going through. Um, And when I said they're like families, they will protect each other. Um, They do develop their own sense of communities. At one point, it could be, I'll give an example, like, Years after I was homeless, years after. And when I say years, I'm talking about a good five, six years. So I'm going to work at a Shell gasoline station. One person that was homeless at the time recognized me from Marysville, California. and said, how you doing, brother? I told him, you know, I'm doing all right, you know. And I gave him a couple bucks and uh, let him use my cell phone. Um, because, again, he recognized me. I mean, and that's what I'm saying. It's not like they're the most, like, they got cell phones and computers and networking, but they do have a sense of their own kind of community and they will protect it. This, this is a part of the problem I see is they're not very trustworthy of law enforcement agents. They're not really trustworthy of state workers. Um, a lot of the reasons for this is they don't, they feel like the, they feel like the state's turned, turned away from them. Uh, veterans feel like the government's turned away from them. And just kind of like throwing them out there and just giving up on them. It's kind of like, you know, a parent just kicking you out of the house and just giving up on you. You just got that, the world's fucking giving up on me, fucking problem syndrome. And that really plays with your fucking head. And when you add in drug use on top of that, it really fucking spins a circle in your head. Um, You start getting a lot of resentment built up. So I think to fully understand it, I wouldn't say I would recommend people going out and living among them because, like I said, it is highly it is a highly dangerous world. It's not it's not an easy life to live. It's definitely not an easy life to pretend to live. Um, a lot of people get hurt that ways. Um, and like I said, there is a good portion of families out there that will lie, straight up will lie, and uh, they give birth, and those kids are brought up in homeless camps. So there is a good portion of children out there that homeless life is all they know. And they're damn good at it, too, meaning they'll travel. And uh, I kind of compare the homeless to kind of like the classic gypsy stereotype because one of the things that you would do was, you know, you would uh, do what they call hustling in one area. Then you would move to a different area. Um, Myself, I would get whatever jobs I could. Like I said earlier, McDonald's, um, dishwashing jobs. I would work up and save up enough money to um, basically travel to another area. And you just kind of kept moving like that. Um, it is extremely hard to get hired whenever you, you have hygiene problems based on your environment that you're living in. I will say that. Um, and I know there's educated people who's like, well, you could go to a laundromat and you know you could use this and that. And you're right, you could. Um, unfortunately, I was staying with people that um, I would give them over a way over what I should have given them. I was young and naive at the time to be able to sleep on a couch. So I was left with like maybe a hundred dollars out of my check because I was working like, you know, fast food jobs. And that was years ago. Uh, Minimum wage back then was like five something an hour. So I think that's part of it. Um, 
and that's why I included the story about the girl that was living in the hotel because that's a clear example of how much. Now, I do want to point out that that same female that was in that documentary about a year and a half later was finally approved for a three-bedroom apartment. So there is potential out there, but that's why I wanted to include the three different types. I was one of the types I was actively trying to get off the streets, and I finally did. And um, it's out there. Chances are, you know, yeah, it could get difficult. And did I give up at times? You're absolutely right, I did. Um, however, even when I given up, I had snapped myself out of it and continue fighting forward. And I think you have to have that mentality of survival to be able to do it. Um, so I was able to do that. So, but there is people I met along the way um, that just straight up enjoyed being homeless. That was just the life that they lived. One guy in particular, I'll never forget him. He was an older gentleman. The reason why I'll never forget him is when I got a disarmable discharge out of the California Conservation Corps for being young and stupid. I'm not going to go into details about that at this point. Um, I ended up on the streets, and I didn't know where to go to. I didn't know what to do. Um, at this point in my life, I never experienced, you know, that feeling that you get when you finally realize that this is it. This is all you got, what you're seeing, lights and traffic, and this is it, man. You better you better wake up, you know, and this this older gentleman has spotted me, and he wore a black baseball cap with the red cross on it, and um, it was about three days later. I guess I didn't feel comfortable with leaving that spot, really. You know, I left during the day to try to find work or whatever, and I would go back to that same spot to sleep at by those bushes I was mentioning earlier. And Raven found me, was his name. Um, he had a, you know, he was an addict, so he had that skinny personality look to him. He was really tall. He had a long goatee, though, salt and peppered. And um, it turned out over a period of time when I got to know him, he was a United States Marine Corps veteran. He was infantry in Vietnam War. Um, and we talked, you know, and I got, I, I actually talked to a lot of the older ones. <coughs> and that's why I learned so quickly. I didn't gravitate towards the younger homeless people. I gravitate towards the, old, the older ones because I wanted to learn how to survive. And he did. He taught me, you know, this is where you can go to get a free sandwich. This is where you can go to get some shelter. This is where you can go to get a shower if you need it. Um, here's the rules here, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, he taught me what to look for as far as danger goes and what, you know, I mean, what was safe and what wasn't kind of thing, you know, so he was my mentor on the streets, basically. Unfortunately, he's passed away with a bad, um, bad heroin deal that still haunts me to this day. Um, and I don't want to go into that right now. It's actually really hard to even really go into, um, because I witnessed it. However... I will say there's other ones that stick out, like Whitey. He used to carry a guitar. Um, he was an elderly gentleman that stayed at the rescue mission. His name was Whitey. They called him Whitey because of his um, long freaking white beard, like ZZ Top, man. Um, and he was like, he was, he was a Cadillac rider. What I mean by Cadillac rider is um, on the streets, when they, when they say Cadillac, what that means is when you see trains and you see a car that's open, attached to the train uh homeless people will call that a cadillac because it's wide open smooth selling you know smooth riding <coughs> if you can catch it so they call that a cadillac and as i know it's interesting but why do you also have something else to him that was unique one he was also in the marines and he was a minister in the marines and during vietnam actually and he showed me one time when he took off his foot how he was missing a certain number of toes because he was trying to hop that Cadillac and the wheels just started spinning and off went his toes. But it didn't stop him, though. You know, there's a lot of stories like that. You know, there's a... Uh, I've met all kinds of people. Uh, there was two prostitutes that um, used to live next door. Uh, that girl that was telling you I was dating at the time you know, it was an alleyway housing system. And, uh, in fact, that street that we lived on is no longer there. I was amazed. And I went back years later and three of the streets were considered so contaminated that they just got rid of them. Um, 
but anyways, there's a girl there that uh, she was a heroin addict, and um, I remember how she had a bachelor's degree that's good enough for her to teach at a college level. And I asked her one time, I said, why don't you clean up and like, you know, use that degree to your advantage and go back to school, man, you know? And she looked at me and she said, sadly, I make more in one night than I'd ever make at being a teacher. <coughs> now, granted, I feel like she made that personal choice. Earlier when I said there's different types, she was one of those types. Um, I also feel like her girlfriend was a big part of the problem because she kept her on the streets. Um, now, moving on to youth, um, there are youth groups that they literally travel together. Um, they will fight together. They will travel together, and they will eat together. Um, and it's not always the best of food, but you make do with what you can get kind of thing. Um, I've lived in, you know, like I said, by the river. I've lived in abandoned buildings, um, abandoned houses, um, side of the streets. Uh, <clears throat> I will say that doing it, you do learn a lot about people. Um, because in between, if you ask people for change, it, you can really judge a book by their facial reactions. I mean, you can really kind of get a sense to who they are. And you really learn to study people. I think that's part of it, too. You learn to study pretty uh, people pretty well. Um, and I think that's an instinct thing. You, uh, you start to notice their body language, their shoulder movements, their head movements, how they're walking, how they're carrying themselves. This all comes into factors. Um, so it is disappointing when I hear people say we need to clean off the streets. They're getting out of, they're getting out of hand. They're getting out of hand. We need to do something. They're, they're just everywhere. They're everywhere. We don't know what to do. So they're going to make camping cities illegal. Well, where are they going to go? Do you get what I'm saying? It, it, that's the thing. And that's why I said earlier, I do feel like if you deport more illegals, you will see a huge problem go away. Uh, when I talk about illegal immigration, it's issues like that that I notice that uh, there is a lot of them with fake birth certificates and social security numbers that is getting help. I know one particular in Cushing, Oklahoma, that is a man that used to be a manager at a restaurant. I'm not going to say her name for obvious reasons. Um, she was one of the managers, however, and her husband was an American and, um, he's African American gentleman and she had a nice house. She had a brand new car. Her husband had a brand new car. Her husband was actually in the process of becoming a probation officer, believe it or not. And the whole time she's still legal with fake numbers, fake birth certificate number. And guess what? Her kids were getting extra assistance at school. They were all involved in athletic programs. Herself was working 40 hours plus, 40 plus hours every week. Um, and she was also getting food stamps, food shelter programs, assistant living programs, meaning help with the paying bills and whatnot. So being exposed to that scene at first hand, yeah, I do feel like if you get rid of those people that are illegals, then yeah, you're gonna you're gonna see a huge number show up that wow, we have this much more than what we had before because we got rid of part of the problem. I say part of the problem because it's not the whole problem. But that's a big chunk of the problem. There's a lot more than what you realize. You know what I'm saying? And I could go on and on about personal experiences with it, uh, to give examples, and I probably could. I'm not going to. I wanted this to be a shorter of a podcast, honestly, um, because it's one of those, this could turn into one of those personal discussions that could go on for hours because I experienced so much of it. And I know firsthand from seeing different types of people and I firsthand have seen what our government and what these veterans are going through to get medications. And a lot of these veterans really had, you know, messed up experiences. And when they came back, they had some mental problems and the VA hospitals would help them out. <clears throat> but their families would turn their backs on them. So they went to the streets because all they knew was chaos. You get what I'm saying? That's why I feel like they would provide more money assistance for veterans. It would, it would provide more money assistance for people to get off the streets, which would mean more motivation for them. It would decrease the homeless population. 
as well as you try to get the youth involved in, you know, like youth homelessness programs to get them off the streets as well. That's something else that needs to be focused on because there is such a huge number out there that people don't even know. I mean, it's massive. If you if you really, truly understand what it's like to be homeless on the streets, then you will know there's a freaking massive amount of number of homeless youth, both that are runaways and people that was born into it, that as they age, they kind of find other friends and they click with them and move around together. Um, so it really does become that sense. And they really do feel like, you know, all I have is jail. So and I don't want to get locked up at this point. It's not cold enough. You know, you'll hear them say that. Um so, yeah, I mean, and honestly, like I said before, they'll protect each other. A lot of times they'll even say, this is my mom or this is my dad, you know, from people they know from either a bad neighborhood or just older people that were homeless, you know, and they'll lie for each other, like I said, in cover because they don't, you know, whatever. So and that's how they get by. Um, I've even known one person, his name was Marty Wells, and he was a homeless guy. His wife, I don't remember her name in particular, um, but they had a little girl that was five years old that lived on the streets with them. I was homeless at the time, too. Uh, we used to stay in abandoned houses off and on. And Marty would work labor jobs, you know, um, the best he could. Um, but most of the time, like I said before, they picked illegals over him. There was a lot of times where they would load up a whole truck full of illegal Mexicans and leave him and, like, five other guys behind. So he would spend the rest of the day trying to find ways to make money so they could get something to eat or maybe a room at a hotel. You get what I'm saying? So that's examples out there that I have, and I have a lot more than that um, is the reason why I say that. We do. That's why I stand by our president when he says we need to do something about this massive illegal immigration problem that we have in this country because it's such a physical problem, for meaning financial problem, because it really is. Um, it's such an outrageous number and they're depleting the system at such a fast rate that they don't have assistance program for everybody anymore. They just simply don't have it to the point to where they're having to lay off state workers and make them work at home on their laptop at a different rate of pay because they can't afford to pay to work in the office anymore. They can't pay to afford to pay the gas. Now, I'm not saying they're not out there doing their job because there evidently are still workers out there, but I'm, what I'm saying is they had to cut the programs in half, which means they had to lay off a bunch of them. Then on top of that, this cuts into other programs that people used to be able to get assistance at. They're not available anymore. Where's the money going to? I'll tell you where it's going to, and you don't want to hear it, but it's the truth. You need to fix the illegal immigration problem to fix a lot of the problems in this country. One of them will be in homelessness. A lot of people can't get approved for assistance. I was told at one point and it was an employment agency place that was designed to help you find work. And I was actually told, go ahead and sign here, but I want to be honest with you about something. And I said, what's that? The waiting list could be up to six months long before we find you a job. I was floored. I was mainly floored because one of the guys I saw was a Mexican gentleman that could barely speak English. And he got a job that fucking day. You know why? Because that guy would get, you know, a job for a much cheaper rate and guess what happened to me? I ended up going back out to the streets and trying to figure out a way to make money because I had to do something. I had to get something to eat. You know what I mean? So I had to figure out some way to do something. The whole time, though, I would be, you know, calling from pay phones to check up with these workers and these programs as long as it took because I never gave up. But not everybody has the strength to not give up. You know what I mean? After a while of being told no or the waiting list is this long and a while of being told this and that and you're seeing all this other stuff happen, some people just frankly give up. And, you know, you can sit there on your high horse and try to say that you're going to fight tooth and nail to the death and um, some people can and some people can't. Most people can't. Um, this is a sad reality that we're living in. Um, I do think that there needs to be more exposure about the homeless populations out there. Um, you know, part of it is they're having a hard time finding out actual numbers because there's only so many people that can go out there to do it. And there's so many of them, so many of them. And believe me, when I say there's some hidden camps out there, you won't find them. Some of them are underground. Some of them are underneath bridges. Some of them are in tree lines. Some of them are in pastures. It just depends on where you're at, you know, and they will have booby traps set up to get you, too. 
You ain't coming in there unless you know somebody or you know the way around. I'll tell you that much. Um, so in short, I will sum it up like this. Fix the illegal immigration problem. Once you fix that and you start aggressively deporting them, you'll start to see a rise in numbers to where we could afford to help people that need help within our own damn society. I think it's time for us to wake up and realize that our citizens of our own country need help. But so many people that's involved in politicians, uh, political aspects, so many people, so many programs out there that are pushing to, you know, <coughs> that are pushing, you know, to adopt foreign kids, for example. A lot of these kids that don't get adopted, they end up in um, boys' homes or girls' homes, and then they age out of these homes. Guess what? They end up on the streets, and when they end up on the streets, they become the homeless. When they end up on the homeless, the homeless population goes up. But people want to adopt what Angelina Jolie adopted or Madonna adopted or whoever. you know. So we need to get back. Our nation needs to get back to focusing on our own people before it's too late because we're so busy focusing on other cultures instead of the American culture that we're running out of programs and help for our own people because we're too busy worrying about people from other countries. You need to wake up and realize that the situation with homelessness is much more deeper, much more vast, and much more important than what you might actually realize. Because this situation is getting out of hand at a really rapid rate. And it's only recently that people are waking up and seeing it in their neighborhoods that they're like, we need to do something. Because it was much easier to ignore when you weren't able to see it. But now that you're able to see it every day, now you're going, there's a problem. And we need to clean up the problem. I just gave you some solutions to how to start the process of getting it. And we need to get back to that aspect. We need to get back. We need to be a country that is taking care of our citizens. And once we take care of our citizens, then we can worry about helping out these other people. Because right now, we're not helping out enough with our own citizens. We're too busy worrying about helping out illegals and too busy worrying about helping out other nations that we're not focusing on helping out our own nation and our own people and our own youth of our nation because we're too busy worrying about a picture op or a damn fucking newspaper article saying about how much we're helping out this other place or these other group of people, disaffranted, uh, whatever, you know, war, t war terror and freaking countries, war and torn, but whenever we can't take care of our own country, you know, people warned them. Things are going to start looking bad, and they ignored it. And guess what? They're popping up every freaking where now because the numbers are just growing because they're too busy spending all this money on people they shouldn't be spending it on because they're not spending it on our citizens of our country. They're sending it on something else. That's the problem. I'm sorry to sound so aggravated about it, but it aggravates me that people can't see this simple solution to it. You know, It's such a simple solution to it. This is how easy it is to fix, man. Why don't you just freaking fix it? Why don't you start focusing on our country, on our citizens, on our children of this nation, instead of worrying about these other nations? That's what we need to get back to, and I hope we will. And I think there's signs of progress. I think President Trump is starting to do it, and I think he needs to continue to do it. And I hope Mike Pence keeps working on it, and I hope these other senators do, and I hope people keep pulling their heads out of their asses and start waking up because I think they're starting to. I think there's signs out there that they are. So I, I pray that we keep moving forward. Once again, I want to end this with saying, fix America. Focus on the United States of America. Focus on the people of this own country that need help. Focus on that before you focus on other things. Once again, this is Blue Collar Thoughts. Have a good night.